one mike with spray jones and we're taking a look at spray foam but to do that i want to address something can i inject my foam into a wall if i had a pour foam not a spray foam if i had a liquid pour foam that stayed liquid in a liquid state long and didn't didn't spray could i drill a hole and like pour this stuff in and then just fill the cavity up that way very 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 popular question the answer is no. You want to check out right now? There you go. One minute in, done. No, don't do it. Stick around. I'm going to tell you why not to. If you have drywall, your chances are you're going to have some type of insulation in the wall cavity. That insulation is going to be a hindrance to putting foam where it needs to go. It's already in the way. It's going to bind onto the foam. It's going to prevent the liquid from flowing it's going to hold it up. It's going to act like a filter and choke it off from getting all the way down. It's not an empty hollow cavity at that point. So there's your first problem. Secondly, you are relying on the rise of the foam to fill the cavity. You're assuming that you're going to drill sequential holes in, get the foam down to the bottom and then rely on the foam coming up, rising up. That means that the foam has got to be pushing. It's pushing on all four sides, it's pushing downward, to the back, to the front, to the sides, right? So that it will push upward. Well, spray foam in an enclosed situation will create upwards of 40 PSI of pressure. So if it can push the drywall off the wall and buckle it, it will. If it can push the wall out, it will. If it can find a hole or a chunk or a cut, like if you're using steel stud, you can't fill a steel stud wall because steel stud walls have punch outs in the sides and once the spray foam gets to that level where there's a punch out it's going to flow laterally off to the side and you're going to lose a lot of your rise ability so why take the chance you'd be paying in a three and a half inch wall you'd be paying for three and a half inches plus of insulation in a two by six five and a half inches when spray foam or particularly closed cell polyurethane foam is polymerized and made from the raw components into the final product there's such a thing called exothermic heat that's created exothermic heat if you build enough of it fast enough it can crack the foam and the core temperature of that foam can become so hot that once it gets oxygen to it it can spontaneously combust so you have to use special chemistry when you're doing large pours or large sprays of foam, you have to use special foam that doesn't build up high exothermic heat. There isn't anything on the market that's going to do that for you. So the other issue that you run into is that how are you going to verify that the material is mixing, right? I mean, we are spraying into a wall cavity and seeing that A and B are the correct color. It's adhered. It's not popping off. Visually, we can expect it very quickly. Post-spray, we can inspect it for hours or days after. But if you're doing injection, you won't be able to tell whether it adhered or not or whether it's mixed properly or not. And I mean, in Canada, there is absolutely no pore injection foam certified that I'm aware of at this time. And this is 2020. I'm not aware of any pore injection foam that meets the standard because every standard for building code in Canada is spray polyurethane foam, not injection. And this, this goes right back to the old urea formaldehyde days. I mean, UFI stands for UFFI. It's an acronym. It means urea formaldehyde foam insulation and then in, in the late 60s throughout the 70s and it became really popular in the in the mid 70s into the early 80s there there were a lot of energy grants to retrofit your home so the way that you did this was you drilled a hole and you injected this foam insulation that was made from urea formaldehyde the only problem was <laughs> it wasn't mixing always the guys weren't actually having the material mix properly so as a result they take their money and run to the next place because it was the you know Ufi gold rush and people were having toxic chemicals leaching into the home absolutely horrible so this stuff had to be removed it had to be remediated and as a result you, to this day in Canada you're signing off on mortgages that there's no known Ufi in the house if it was built in a certain time period uh, so you'd be right back into this boat again if you've got somebody going in and injecting closed cell foam or even open cell foam into your walls 
you're not going to know if it's on ratio. You're not going to know if it's mixed. You're not going to know if it's adhered. I mean, and then another question is, I mean, is it going to work in conjunction with the vapor barrier or not? Is the, is the caulking and the vapor barrier tore up and in pieces? How many times will we heard? Oh, the, the vapor barrier is junk. It's no good. Well, okay, fine. Then, then you bring the foam in. You're going to rely on the foam to be your vapor barrier. But what happens if the foam doesn't adhere? What if it doesn't seal up? What if it doesn't bond to the studs? What if there's sawdust laying in the bottom of this thing and it, it grabs onto the sawdust and then lifts and there's a you know, one inch gap between the foam and the bottom plate? You won't know about it. So there's just, there's just boatloads of logistical, technical, quality control issues in a blind cavity. I mean, not to mention the fact that there can be horizontal cross blocking and you won't know if it's made it all the way down to the bottom or not unless you're beating on it and having to open things up. I've done quite a bit of pore injection on HSS on commercial buildings where it stands for hollow steel, hollow structural steel, where the HSS is required to be filled with foam because the architect wants it. Most people don't know this, but I mean, that, that's difficult enough to do. We have to drill a hole with a mag drill, inject the foam in. But this is quarter inch thick and three eighths thick steel. And you have to drill a hole to let the air out because as the, as the foam is coming up, it's like a piston head and it's pushing air inside the cavity and that air pressure is getting higher and higher and it will actually try to push the light, fluffy, liquidy foam back down and you'll get pockets of gaps and uh, inclusions inside the foam. So unless you can get the air out at the same time as putting the foam in, and that's a technical thing. That is not just as easy as drilling a couple of holes like I made it sound. Like we, You need to know sequentially how many holes you can even drill, how much foam you can fill vertically before you have to go to the next level. You have to make sure you get the air out of it, and you have to make sure that the foam is 100% filled. The, the, and if it can, again, push it sideways, it will. I mean, on a quarter inch steel I-beam or, or a hollow steel column, no big deal, but on 2x4, two 2x6, by two by huge problem, huge problem. I mean, push your framing around, crack your wall, for sure push your drywall, break it. I mean, 40 PSI is a lot of force, right? You know, take a piece of drywall out, span it between 16 on centers and exert 40 PSI of force on it and see how long it stands up to it. So. The way to do things on retrofit, if you've got an old vintage property, it's the time-tested, true method, folks. You open the wall up, you upgrade your plumbing, you upgrade your electrical, you upgrade anything else on the outside walls while you have it open, confirm that the structure is sound, and then spray the foam insulation into the walls, visually check everything, anyone can check it, you can check it, you can check it over days. You can check it with a thermal imaging camera, and then and only then you put your sheetrock back up, your paneling back up, your tile back up, whatever, and away you go. And that has always been and always will be the number one way. I know there's products out there that claim that they can do this and what have you, but I think I've given some really good answers as to why I'd be very cautious to signing up to this. I know there's some commercial products out there that can be injected into masonry walls and cinder block walls and they, they, they tap con in, they drill a hole in with a hammer drill, inject into it. But they're dealing with very solid structures and they're dealing with the outside of the structure usually, right? Which is very different when it comes to rules, liability, and just technically how things are going to uh, stay in place, right? If you're dealing with a masonry brick wall that's got clear span all the way down, well then you can sequentially fill the cavity up and send in a little camera to see what's going on. It's just very, very different than some old 2x4 wall where it's difficult to see. And I mean, if you have an old home with balloon construction, sometimes those, those walls are 18 feet, you know, 16 feet continuous. They go all the way from the basement or from the foundation level all the way up to the rooftop. So. How are you going to stop the foam? Where are you going to be? Where are you going to start? How are you going to build sequentially to get all the way up? You can't do it in one shot. You can't do it in three. You can't do it in five. Right? So the technical issues on this are pretty monumental. So I hope this is of some benefit to somebody. I hope somebody's sitting here watching this at night and says, holy cow, like, let's not do that. Let's open the walls up. I know it's a pain having to open up walls and cavities up, especially if you've got a heritage property. But it is the one and only way to deal with it properly and to avoid heartache and you've spent all this money and had all this foam and now you've got all these other new problems. So 
share like and subscribe send this to somebody that needs to see it uh, comment on what what I'm saying and let's get some dialogue going and see you on the next one